Welcome to St. David's. Nice to have you today. You may be seated. The introit is a prayer uh, for all of us, not just for the choir. Lead me, Lord.
Maybe seated. Let us pray. Lord, quiet our hearts that we might know you. Help us even as we sing that hymn that many of us sang for so many years every Sunday reminding us that as we come into the service we come into your presence we come into a time of knowing you that our opening prayer time is a time of opening ourselves to you and so as we open Lord we recognize who you are We recognize that you are the God whose hand created the vast universe. The stars, the galaxies, constellations, all that is in space across millions of light years. And you know us on our tiny planet and all of us, all the billions that are here. You know our atmosphere, you know our our earth, you know the the status of the tides and the waters, all the weather patterns. But most of all, Lord, you know each of us. And as we come closer in to your throne, we recognize that we are not worthy to approach the just judge, the Almighty One, the Creator. And yet we boldly come through Jesus, acknowledging that we do have in our hearts rebellion, we do have in our hearts questions and doubts, we do have many things which mitigate against your work here in this place and across the city and province and country. Help us, Lord as we confess our sins to you quietly, as we confess those attitudes and those actions, those inactions that go against what you want for us, so we quietly confess our sins. Thank you that in Jesus Christ you hear our confessions, you honor our honesty, and as we are vulnerable with you, so we find strength in this life to live, and the reassurance of forgiveness for all who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for the privilege of following you and learning a little bit more of your ways this day. Help us, even as we say again together that prayer you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Sarah, for playing uh, piano today.
Okay, let's have our uh, children's hymn. It's uh, Jesus, friend of little children, six five six in the hymnal. That's their, that's your hymn, boys and girls. Afterwards, you come right up. Six five six. Jesus, friend of little the children, be my friend and guide. Take my hand and ever keep me by your side. Step by step, oh, lead me onward, growing into you. Wiser, stronger, still increasing in your truth. Never leave me nor forsake me all. give up. Well, boys and girls, how are you doing? Do you like the warm weather in October, like 17 last night? Did you, did you like that? Do you like that? Anybody longing for the winter? Raise your hands. Just checking, just checking. Adults longing for the winter? Let's raise your hands. God bless you, John. I know that's cross skiing's on its way. Cross country skiing, that's good. No, it's uh, it's good to be together, and we always take a little time to to think about what uh, God is doing here. And I brought something along with me this time, and so it's in my little bag here. And I'm trying to remember what it is. You believe me? No. Oh. What do you think? Everyone thinks it's a bell. I don't know why. Probably because it is. Now, this is a this is a bell that was giving me. What's that on the bell? Anybody see what that's on the bell? That's a horse, yeah. Any kind of horse, do you think? No, no, it's, there's no horn on it. It's no, no, no unicorn to that. Anybody? Does that remind you? Choir? Yeah, carousel. Yeah, that's right. What do you do on a carousel? You ride? You ride kind of in a circle, yeah. It is kind of in a circle. Do you enjoy that? Have you done that? Yeah? How many, how many boys and girls have ever ridden on, a, ridden on a horse on a carousel? Yeah, yeah. Adults? Adults? Oh, just checking. You're with me. That's good. That's good. You're all with me. Well, you know, um, she's a teacher, the, the woman who uh, gave me this bell, and... Um, she um, uh, also was the superintendent of our Sunday school uh, out west. And um, what do we usually use bells for? Anybody know? To call people? Yeah, that, that's true. Anybody else? There's lots of right answers. For, as a fire drill? I, mm, it could be, but I haven't, I haven't seen it. School, bing, bing, bing. Was it, what are they bing, bing, bing at school for? Oh, okay, for lunch and and recess, the things that we excel in, right? Or I used to at least. And and uh, and so uh, bells are used to bells are used for a lot of different things. Now this bell is used just to listen to. Okay, you ready? You ready? Now, when you when it makes a sound, what do you notice about that sound? Does it go like it echoes? Yeah, sort of. Sort of. Listen to it again. Listen to it again. This is an exercise in listening. Did you notice? Did you? You did, didn't you? Okay, listen. I know it's hard when you're young. Yeah, go ahead. It's high and sweet sounding. Yeah, it, it's. Um, Sometimes we lose 
the high and sweet sounding things in life. Sometimes we lose a little bit of quiet and the bell reminds us this bell, not the school bell necessarily, that's just trying to keep you on your schedule, but, but this bell reminds us that it's good to listen to important things in life, to take the quiet that we need and to listen to God and God will put us on an amazing ride. Now sometimes it will seem like we're going in circles because that seems to be the way weeks and months and years or maybe just for you guys, minutes and moments and hours but sometimes it feels that way but really there's a beauty there's an excitement I know how I've always felt when I'm about to get on to a ride you know it's just anticipation wow I really want to do this we hope that when you come to church you have that same sense that God has a ride for you and there's a beauty and there's sweetness in that and uh, we want you to that's why we have classes especially for you it's not that we're kicking you out we're trying to give you stuff that, that will make most sense to you at this time in your lives and then as you get a little bit older that you'll choose to join us join your parents along with all the other adults so let's, let's uh, I think that's enough for me talking let's, uh, let's uh, bow our heads close our eyes and uh, say this prayer after me please everyone dear God Thank you for your love. Thank you for the quiet where we can hear what you have to say. Give us the ride where you are leading. In Jesus' name. Amen. the word of God as written in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 33 reading verses 12 to 23 found on page 132-33 in your pew Bible. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, leave these people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this, is a nation, that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, Your presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with you, with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all others, other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know your name. Then Moses said, Now show me your, your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and will proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. 
but my face must not be seen. And from the New Testament, we will read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. And it's found, found on page 1758. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit and so you became a model to all who all the believers of Macedonia and Achaia the Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia your faith in God has become known everywhere therefore we do not need to say anything about it for they themselves report what happened when we visited you they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from the coming wrath. Here ends the readings from his holy word. And if you take with me the Pew Bible and turn to Psalm 99, we'll responsibly read there from Psalm 99. I'll read the first verse and you the next and so on. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. He spoke to them from the pillar of cloud. He kept his statutes and the decrees he gave them. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. God is indeed holy, set apart from all that is evil and deadly. Let's uh, sing together, May the Mind of Christ My Savior, 644. In your, in your hymnal 644.
And Lord, we come to you knowing that we need to hear from you. That the prayer that we just sang together, that our lives would be more in line with your life and way and work and will, would become a reality that would there would be and we would notice changes in our lives as a result of your work in it we turn again to you Lord sometimes we don't even desire to change but merely to carry on help us we pray as we seek you as we seek to live out your word and be faithful to you that we might do so and help one another to do so through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we made it through another election. Uh, the results, I guess, weren't shocking. Uh, was anybody shocked? There's some change, but the majority government continues to be a majority government. People are talking about the fact that across the six provincial and territorial elections that just took place in the last couple of weeks, there was quite a low voter turnout. Some argue that there is more change in a province that didn't even have a provincial election, but has a new premier. The PCs in Alberta elected their first woman premier, who sounds quite different from her predecessors. But I, I'm not here to talk politics. I hope you're happy about that. I'll leave that to those of you who are more capable in that area than me. But I am here to talk about what I call life certainties life certainties. You know I talk often here about death. It's not because I like being morbid or like focusing on death or because I, I get some, uh, uh, some kind of a uh, commission whenever I talk about death. It's, it's, it's not really that way at all. It's really to gain spiritual perspective. Uh, you know that Steve Jobs, the for famous Apple CEO, died in the last, is it 10 days or the last couple of weeks at least ago. He, uh, he spoke to Stanford graduates at their convocation in 2005. I don't know if any of you saw the clips on the news of, uh, of his speech. Let me encourage you, if you have uh, the ability, to watch the entire uh, speech, which is only 14 minutes and 34 seconds, on, on YouTube, if you have that uh, technology. Because uh, Steve, in the midst of his battle with cancer, learned a great lesson. I'm sorry it takes, often takes in our lives such health loss to teach us lessons as he learned. Sometimes we only learn once we've lost something or lose someone. He said that it was when his life was in question from a diagnosis of a rare form of pancreatic cancer in 2004 that he truly learned to value each day, each hour, to know for sure that he loved what he was doing, whether it was at his job or anywhere else. It was then he knew he was fulfilling what he was supposed to be doing in his life. Uh, and I'm summarizing what he said, and I'm not doing a very good job of it. I went, actually went back and, and, and watched it myself. The exact quote is, if you live each day as if it were your last, someday you will certainly be right. That tickled me. I'm glad it tickled a few of you, too. He's, he said that at 50, uh, having had that diagnosis the year before. He had lived each day of his life, life uh, since he had heard this quote at age 17. He says he looked in the mirror and he said to himself, if this were to be my last day on earth, would I still be doing what I'm planning on doing today? Let me say that again. If this were the last day of my life on earth, would I still be doing what I am doing today? And he said if he had a few days in a row where the answer was no, and obviously he did, otherwise he wouldn't have said he did, he knew he had to change something in his life. And he began a process, which he didn't describe in this particular speech, that allowed him to identify what he needed to change. Isn't that a good thing? I don't, I don't do that much. I don't know if you do that much. But I would recommend it. 
Now, as I was beginning to think of this for myself, I think this is the hardest part for a preacher. You know, I used to think that my sermons would change people's minds. Uh, I used to think even more foolishly that people's lives would be radically changed by the things I would say Sunday to Sunday. To Sunday. I, now I realize, more than ever, that this is God's work, what we're doing here, what we're taking time for out of your busy lives today, is God's work. It's not my work. Uh, I know I can't even debate as well as some of you because, frankly, you're better speakers than I am. We have many people here who give lectures and have given talks their whole lives on many, many important subjects. And I realize that as I stand here Sunday by Sunday, I'm just another voice in your life. And it's taken me a little, a little while to learn, to learn that. I'm about 25 years doing this now, somewhere around there. But I can be a voice in your life for good, for exploration in a God-word direction, if that's the way you are choosing to be open, for behavioral change toward action in line with what's God's best for you, God's best for the community, God's best for your family and neighbors and friends. But I know I'm only one voice in a sea of voices in your life. That's why we always look to another voice during these times, during our prayers, during the sermon. And that is the one voice we all look forward to hearing is God's voice. We hear God's voice as we read the scriptures. We hear God's voice as we seek to please the one who gives us life. Uh, those people who are in 12-step programs uh, find step 11 very instructive. It's one, I think, that comes quite a ways down the road because it comes with experience and maturity, and it reads like this. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. Praying only for the knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. I think that's what it, Moses was getting at in Exodus 33 when he asks for the presence of God to go with him and with the people. Moses wants to continue to experience the conscious contact with God that 12-step people rely upon. It is the power to change broken, addicted lives into healthy, giving lives. Moses even prays for God's glory, but this is too much for even God to be able to grant him, so he says he'll give him a greater vision of who he is, but not the whole nine yards, because the whole is something too much for him. So each of us needs an experience of God to carry us forward in life. We need the presence of God remembering he is with us in Jesus Christ. We need the quiet it takes to be with God. I, 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 I use the bell. Lots of spiritual paths use a bell just to quiet themselves, to hear the, the ring as it expands out from uh, the meeting of the clapper and the, the bell part of it. We need the glory of God, changing our desires to God's own, changing not just our speech, but also our actions. If we have this ongoing desire to learn, to humble ourselves before God, to pray, then perhaps in that moment God will give us more duties, more responsibility. Sometimes, as we humble ourselves, we find God lifts us up for leadership. Because we're not looking, as we look for new elders in this coming year, we're not looking for people who already know how good they are, how wonderful they are in leadership. What we're looking for are people who are willing to serve, who are willing to learn. And first and foremost, a willingness to follow God no matter what takes, where that takes us which is both a risky and a costly business because it often feels like wilderness in leadership. Uh, it's a lot of going to meetings, 
going to visit people who may, may not even want to visit from you, going to try and reach out to those who say they're part of this movement but not really sure if they are or aren't. It often feels like a wilderness rather than a refreshing oasis. But it's in that desert that we learn to follow. There are times in the church where we feel we are being tested, or at least times where I feel that way. We are tested by our temptations inside ourselves and inner feelings of shame and guilt. We are tested by others' comments about us, to us, expecting both attitudes and actions that we may not be able to accomplish. We are tested by cultural norms and mores that more and more seem to be out of sync with Christianity and with following Jesus. Certainly in the 50s and 60s, you're not going to church? Why aren't you going to church? It's a great thing to do. 2011, church? You go to church? Why do you do that? In fact, Reg Bibby, the famous Canadian sociologist, says that people don't even want to find a church, according to the polling that he's done. They're not even looking for church. They're looking for ministry. They're looking for spiritual help. The question is, are we providing such? On the back of the bulletin, we have been listing all the regular groups for you to consider whether you might at least try visiting one or more of them to help you in your faith. There are a few opportunities here. And there may be others that would be better suited to you and to your schedule. This is always a, it's always a challenge. Perhaps we can help you in forming those groups by providing a leader or helping you in leadership over a new group. This is a time for us to be asking ourselves, what makes a good leader? Certainly it is the desire to serve that comes from the Lord who serves us. It is the desire to learn from the Lord who teaches those who are willing to be taught. It is the desire to do what the Lord says once we understand what he said to us. Jesus was tested in his ministry. You know that. We read a story that... Did we read? Yeah. Did we not read from Matthew? No. <laughs> yeah, I knew I did. I always leave something out in the, in the, in, in the service. Yeah, it was planned, right? No, no. I wish I could say that. My brain doesn't, and my heart doesn't let me say that. Let me read uh, Matthew 22. I'm thinking something was a little bit faster today. Matthew 22. 15 to 22. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. That sounds like a test. Huh? They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. To God, what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. There we got it in. Perhaps you know that story. I, I, perhaps that's the first time you've ever heard it. The Pharisees wanted to trap Jesus by asking him what, what we call an either-or question. The question was simply, is it right to pay taxes or not? That's a good question. Pertinent question for today. All the people listening knew it was a military, occupational government that, uh, who were against their religion, who was in power. They knew that if Jesus said yes, that they would question him about supporting an evil government. Clearly not a legitimate one. And if he said no, then he would be encouraging people to break the law and not submit to the governing powers, which is against the scriptures. So they had him in one of these binds where he could not give a correct answer. It's like that classic question. Have you heard it? 
When did you stop beating your spouse? There's no way to answer that question if you answer it without hurting yourself. Yeah. Now, the question of paying taxes is not just an ancient one. Apparently, it's a central issue in Europe today. Do you want my, I'll give you my 15-second European economic crisis summary. In Greece and in other countries, apparently people feel that they can choose to not pay their income taxes at the federal level or their property taxes at the local level, and the government chooses not to enforce these taxes. There it is. That's 15 seconds. That's my simple analysis an analysis of the debt crisis in Europe today. I, I know it's more complicated than that, but, but this goes to the heart of how countries function financially. While well, Jesus chose to avoid the philosophical debates around taxes, just as we often choose to avoid the philosophical debates around death. Death and taxes, so-called two certainties of life, Jesus rather asks for a coin i got to love that. I, I, I thought it was brilliant myself. It's, it's what I call the, the panhandler's response to debate. Spare change. And Jesus asks the simplest of questions, just as he does still for you and I today. Do you love me? He asks. He asks with a coin. Whose picture's on that, and why is it there? It's the emperor's picture, and he is the one to whom the money goes, they said very confidently. Well then, give him what he wants. Give God what God wants. And so, strangely enough, you know, so many people think God wants your money, and that's, all the, that's what a church is all about. God wants your money, and that's what church is all about. And uh, we do look for money. Of course we look for money. You know, we look for money to keep the buildings going, to uh, keep me and my wife in food and clothing and housing, which is very much appreciated. I, tell, I told people I've been living for decades on charity. We pay for a uh, part-time administrator and a very part-time music director who's sometimes not here, but has lots of friends who fill in. Uh, we, we, uh, we do ask for money, but it, it, m- church isn't about money. It's about trying to understand what it means to live our lives for God and to be a good influence in this community. Trying to understand what it means when Jesus says, follow me. And living that out in our lives. The main function of the church is not fundraising. I'd like, to, I'd like the church to fundraise a little bit more, F-U-N. It's about the God who gives us life. And uh, nobody's ever forced to give money here, but when you do know the God who gives you life and love him and want to see all his ways as best as possible right here, then give away and be as generous as you can be. Be more generous than you ever have been. Because as I say way too often, you only keep what you give away. In the end, it's all given away anyway. So, as we come to the end of Death and Taxes and Leadership, that's the name of the sermon today, it's about following God, following Him with your life, following Him with your finances, following Him with your gifts, your leadership. Maybe God is calling you to consider a leading here. We believe whatever you would offer to God, it's really for God and we receive the benefit. But it's much more for your sake in your relationship with God than it is just because the minister has to be paid and the other workers here and the church has to be cleaned or, or kept up. So as we seek to honor God, let us give creatively, generously, and think as never before how we can make this place the best it has ever been. Let us pray.
And Lord, we just take a quiet moment. You know us. You know all about us. You know what stage of life we're in. Whether young or old. We ask you to help us to know what it means to give our all to you. Because we trust you. And we love you. And we do receive so much benefit from this place. From you working among us. From one another. And so we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bulletin's real good at this point. There's a few announcements. Uh, I'm away this week at Synod. Uh, Kathy's already gone, uh, but we'll be the delegates there at Synod. Synod is our... uh, uh, there's four levels of government in the Presbyterian Church. There's this, the local elders, the session, and we lead the local congregation. And then the Presbytery uh, of Newfoundland is over us. That's all. That's uh, a uh, elder and a minister from each congregation. And then it's all the elders, or one elder, one minister from every congregation across all four Atlantic provinces have an annual meeting, and that's called the Synod. And then once uh, uh, every three to six years, uh, every uh, Presbytery is given a chance, or every yeah, every presbytery is given a chance to send people to the general assembly, uh, which is a national level of our of our church. So that's uh, where where I'm away this week with that, and uh, there it is. There is an insert on that, and we'll be using that to pray. I know we don't usually have set prayers, um, but they've asked us to pray together, and so. At the end, we will be using that, so if you take that out and not be surprised by that, that'd be great. Thanks again to Sarah and Leslie. I think I already said that. Appreciate it. Uh, the fall tea and sale coming soon. You know, note uh, note the, the date and time. Presbyterian Youth Cookbook Fundraiser. There you go. And Amy's saying, yes, make sure you say something about that. Read that, and that'd be great. And... Uh, we're looking to support the youth and what's happening here through Amy. It's great, and we're very appreciative. So, uh, so there you go. I think that's all for now. Uh, if the ushers would come forward, we will take up our tithes, gifts, and offerings at this time. We give to God because God has gifted us and gives so richly to us.
do thank you for the privilege of giving back a portion to say that we love you. We desire your ways and will to become ours here in this place, across this city, across Newfoundland and Labrador, across Canada, and to the ends of the earth. May Jesus Christ be praised. Amen. Closing prayers are a time for each of us to bring our desires and our needs before the Lord as well as those who are needy. And so uh, with this in mind and as well as taking up the ascended thing, uh, let's uh, start with that prayer and then we'll uh, move on from there. I always give time for, and space for you to pray. But let's pray this together first of all. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to walk with us. He promised that we would never be alone. Hear us as we pray. Your presence will be with your faithful servants who will be meeting at the Atlantic Synod. May your presence guide them in all that they do. And may your Spirit give them wisdom and understanding vision and knowledge. Grant them compassion, courage, and the desire to unite in love and peace. Teach them and all of us, Lord, to be faithful stewards of your kingdom here on earth. May they follow your will so that your people may be uplifted and confirmed in their faith. And may your love be declared to all the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's continue to pray. And Lord, we thank you not only uh, for the, the synod, but for every part of our lives as we come to ask you again for our own spiritual health, for changing our own hearts towards you, for giving us the power, the courage to change the things that we can change, and the serenity to accept the things we cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference between those two. Lord, help us as we seek to bring blessing to others in our lives. Lord, for those who are in need spiritually, emotionally, physically or otherwise, we bring them quietly to you now. Help these, we pray. Bring them back to their reason for living. Give them health and strength to choose what is right in your eyes. And help those who are around us today. Be with them, Lord. Be with those who are on our left. Bless them. Draw them into your truth and love. And on our right, help them to know you in powerful ways. For those in front of us, Lord, for your mercy, your care, the sense of being loved, and for those behind us, cause a spirit of encouragement and joy and wisdom to rise up within them. Lord, you know each one of us. You gather us by name. Help us as we seek to know you. 
in our workplaces, in our homes, with our neighbors, in many groups, conferences we go to. Help us to know why we keep coming here, why we keep trusting you, and to share simply the truth of that with others. Thank you for not putting the full burden on each one of us of knowing you. Only our own lives, Lord, we need to be responsible for. But as we have the chance, give us creativity and courage to share with others what we have received from you. Thank you. And thank you for your many mercies to us in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Closing hymn is To God Be the Glory, 350. We are going to use the original words, which are uh, not on that page 350, but if you turn the page, there they are. So, um, hope that's not too confusing to you. I don't know if you ever noticed in our hymnal, but um, not only are there hymn numbers, but there's also page numbers. Are your eyes good enough for those? They're, they're in, in kind of that classified section size print at the bottom. So I'm talking about page 458. Now don't turn if you don't know what I'm talking about. But that's where I am. Okay, everybody's confused? Let's sing. To God be the glory. Don't be confused about that. It's just about my announcement.
Amen.